Thank you for turning on and tuning in to this episode of Musings from a Small Island with your host, Saul Luckman. Musings from a Small Island is my new podcast inspired by my forthcoming memoir of the same name. In both podcast and book, my goal is to provide an artistic take on the world and the situations that affect us all, while serving it up with equal parts irreverent humor and wide-ranging philosophy of a generally optimistic nature. If you'd like to learn more about Musings from a Small Island, as well as my other books, I invite you to subscribe to my irregular newsletter at www.crowrising.com. By doing so, you'll also gain access to a treasure trove of free content, including complimentary online versions of at least two of my books. I also encourage you to follow my blog, Snooze to Awaken, Resources for Lucidity at www.snoozetoawaken.com. There you can stay in the loop daily of what's really going on in this insane awakening planet we call home. Speaking of waking up, my award-winning novel, Snooze, A Story of Awakening, is serialized as an audiobook on my blog. So, sweet dreams. Finally, on whatever venue you find yourself listening to this podcast, please take a moment to hit the follow button and give it a like if you like it. All right, here goes nothing. You know, I've actually resisted doing this for a long time. I've had this idea to do a podcast and I follow a lot of podcasts. I've learned a lot from podcasts. That's actually become one of my preferred learning venues. Certainly I get a lot of my news from a variety of of, of podcasters. And I don't want this to become one of those. I don't want this to become a news-based podcast. I want this to be more subjective, uh, observational, intuitive, and um, insightful perhaps in different ways. So so, uh, We'll see where this goes. I don't know where this is going to go. I have ideas for things I would like to chat about. I don't want these these episodes to go on. Certainly, I don't want them to be longer than an hour. I I value your time and I value my time. So this is a distillation in many ways of of what what I'm picking up on in the news. But let me just start by saying that I... I resisted this until I, I couldn't resist it. I had another really strange night last night that was reminiscent of a night I had in toward the end of 2019 that I've I've talked about in a number of my interviews. I've written I've written at least a, a one blog post on it, and that was the night that I kind of had on a epiphany I had a huge download when I couldn't sleep and I received this entire novel plot into my mind from wherever and that was the inception of Callie the Destroyer which is this uh this Gnostic story Uh, it's a, a goddess novel a visionary novel coming of age fiction Twin flames, cosmic romance, dystopian. It's sort of a pandemic novel. It has jack scenes. It has the pulmonovirus. It has everything that we're going through now that ends up catapulting us into this dystopian future in the novel. At the end of which, at the end of the novel, all of that begins to change and I think we may be on the cusp of those changes now in real time because we're not living a novel. This is our reality. But as a novel, I couched this scenario in a futuristic dystopian world because that was the novel I downloaded that night. So last night I had another very strange wake up call following a a rather disturbing dinner I had with an acquaintance. I don't do a lot of that kind of thing. I don't meet people that often and I don't go out to dinner that often. 
I'm something of a recluse and this whole COVID pandemic thing has made that even more the case. It's, it's hard to meet one's tribe in these times. In some ways it's easier, you know, just follow the people without the masks, you know, but in other ways, uh, even then, there's a lot we might not have in common, you know, because I'm not one of these God and country people, you know, this is like Mel K out there. I'm just, you know, for God and I'm for country and all that's just not me. I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't really consider myself a Christian. I don't, um, I don't have that kind of conservative ethos or background. I was trying to describe myself in this conversation with this gentleman last night that I had met and we had a number of things in common. But I was saying, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a bit of an eclectic soul here. I, there's a lot of that 60s liberal in me, you know, the kind that actually at least gave lip service to wanting human rights and freedom and that sort of thing. Unlike liberals, we have the so-called liberals and uh, pro progressives that we have today who are just communists and fascists, basically. But... I'm not just a liberal, I'm also kind of a libertarian. So I have, I value free market uh, and uh, fair commerce and that kind of thing. But I'm not really just a libertarian, I'm sort of an anarchist. I don't like government. Government means to control your mind. That's the etymology of the word government. And I know as soon as you say anarchist, lots of red flags go up for lots of people because they don't even know what it means, really. I, I think of that quote by George Carlin. Maybe we should this time, maybe, maybe we should just let people do whatever they want. We haven't tried that in a while. Maybe it'll work this time. And I'm paraphrasing. It would be amazing to see if it would just work because people say they have such a knee-jerk reaction to the notion of anarchy or, or lack of formal government that it's hard for them to understand that it's, it's uh, this uh, knee-jerk reaction is probably something that's just programmed in by the deep state that really fears not having control. Like they fear not having control over all kinds of issues and in all kinds of different ways. So many of our, our fears are just programmed fears. So anyway, I'm having dinner. Uh, Lee and I, my partner and I are having dinner with this, uh, this fellow. I don't even know. Uh, what I'll call him. Let's see what what would be a good a good name for him. Let's just call him Chet. And he's a very highly educated fellow um, who had while well, he has a background in law, background in history, well, you know, Latin American studies, or very very uh, like I said, highly educated guy who seems very amicable, very jovial in many ways, kind of a kind of a black Santa Claus of a guy. And we're having a really good time. And then we get on to the subject of critical race theory. And lo and behold, it's like a wolf in sheep's clothing. All of a sudden, this guy is essentially lecturing Lee and myself on, on how Trump and DeSantis and all these other people are essentially modern day Nazis and all of the anti-vaxxers or white terrorists and all of this craziness. And, you know, we've seen this before. We know it's real. I, I, there's, a, there's a blog a blog post by a friend of mine, Andrew Foss, that I posted, I reposted on my Twitter account today called um, Critical Race Theory is Not a Conspiracy Theory. I think that's the, the title of it. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, cultural Marxism is not a conspiracy theory. It's just amazing to me that somebody who's from my generation, actually a little older, who, who is educated, but who has been out of the educational system for a while, could still be so incredibly brainwashed by communist propaganda, basically and could be, would be unable to see what's happening in the world, in this country and throughout the world, for what it is, which is a communo-fascist takeover of the planet or, a, or an attempted takeover. And yes, in some places, 
it seems to be a fait accompli if you think about Australia at the moment and, and Canada. These are, these are very dire situations and my heart goes out to everyone who gives a shit in those cultures about freedom and, and human dignity and sovereignty because they have a hard road to hoe as the saying goes 